right out, take the roots out, just compost it because it won't come back. It's a true annual. That is a frost will obliterate it. Dies back to the roots. And usually um, I'll try to dig out the roots because I may want to, I, I typically am rotating my tomatoes. So I won't plant tomatoes in the same spot each year. I'll do every other year. Just in case there's something in the soil that gets in there, I can let it rest. So I'll put my cucumbers or, or eggplants or something else in there. And then I'll put those in my containers or another raised bed. So I just kind of have this pattern that I do. By the end of this month, are we live? Oh, wow. Hey, welcome, folks. I'm glad that you are tuned in here at Waters Garden Center. We are broadcasting this live on our YouTube and Facebook channels and LinkedIn. Is that right, Ken? Or is it three? So it's three things. So if you ever miss one of these or if you're taking notes and you miss something, you can go back home and just hit, go look for it. And if you're looking at all, it's SEO. It'll find you. And then it'll probably start stalking you across the internet so you can find the information and kind of take more notes to it. So we're welcome to you folks online. My name is Ken Lane. I'm the owner of the Garden Center. I've owned it for 20 years, since 2002. Is it that really, is that possible? I've been an owner since 92, but I've owned 100% of it since 02. My father-in-law, Harold Waters, started the business 60 years ago. And so his daughter uh, grew up in the business I took a liking to her. We've been married for 35 years now. And so we own it together. And so our daughter, Mackenzie, you'll see her floating around, real tall, pretty gal. Uh, she is now training to kind of take it to the next level. So it's like every, every generation kind of adds their magic to it. She's very smart, got big ideas. I can't wait to get out of her way and let's see what she does with it. So it'd be fun. So this, we've got three generations kind of working in the business right now. So it's kind of us. We've learned a thing or two about gardening here locally. It is a challenge. Um, it's different. I think here you have to be more of a gardener. You can't just, like in, uh, we, we had a corporate stint that took us to Sacramento. There I could throw this hat on the ground and it would just start growing. It, would just, it was so easy. You didn't have to be a gardener. You just had to try and it would grow. Here you have to try and you have to be a little bit smarter. There's room for forgiveness, but you got to be more on it. To, to really make it thrive and really make it grow. And it's partly, it's, it's our, the sun is brighter, the wind is windier or drier, and the water is crazy alkaline. That's, those are the three variables that you kind of, it's different than anywhere else in the country. So once you adapt for those things, your success rate just goes, whoo, just takes off. And then your neighbors will be walking by going, how'd you do that? Well, come on in, let me share that. And that's what gardening, that's why gardening is so social. We just help each other do better. This class, we're trying to help you make less mistakes. So you're kind of, at least you're not going backwards if you make a mistake. You're going forwards. Always try to learn by going forward in gardening and, you, and you're gonna have success. And so today we're talking about vines and ground covers. So things that spread. So I think ground covers are more important here. Hey there, more important here than anywhere else in the country because we don't have grass or very little grass. And so we've got rock lawns. And so if you get too much rock, it feels dirty, lunar, like I'm just not 
Like things don't grow in this yard. This is a place where Count Dracula lives. You don't want to, things die here. So you got to be, you got to add some ground covery kind of things to help to more shrubs to help balance that out. And 60% is the number. You want 60% of your property covered in green growth. And that's, a, that's, a, that's what they teach you in landscape architecture 101. There's a ratio that's right. If you get it too much, if you want 70, 80%, it feels like a jungle. It feels like you haven't had a maintenance crew come in for decades. It feels overgrown, feels too tight. If you get it too less than that, it feels like, what'd they do, run out of money? They didn't have enough for like landscaping? What, they didn't have irrigation? What's going on? It feels off, or it's just a vacation home. They don't want any maintenance. We see a lot of that. I like to travel. I don't want any weeds, so they vaporize the whole yard with ground cover and rock and nothing grows and it's just to make their lives easier. So you kind of, you can tell those, those in the neighborhood, you can tell it's kind of a little off. That model home that was, they put to sell the rest of the neighborhood, they always overplant that. So it feels, they're trying to get it, they're cheating it by, by putting more plants in to get you that 60%. Once the development's all done and all those plants continue to grow, it gets overgrown pretty quick. So you got to thin those things out, kind of get it back, keep that ratio back. So 60%. And that's why the ground covers really help out. Now, part of that too, I'm sorry about that. The great thing about a retailer on a major street is you get lots of eyeballs driving by. The negative, when you're teaching a class, it's always loud, uh, especially when the fire trucks go by or the emergency response folks. Um, where did, I, where did I end up? They derailed me. 60%. Oh, the trees count with that. So a tree coming up and that entire space, that counts as the 60%. Not just the trunk, but the whole. So a tree takes up a huge space. If it's a bigger tree, like, a, like the uh, maples are starting to see just a, a hint of that red color showing up. Aspens will be right behind them. So by the end of the month, end of, in two, three weeks, by the 1st of October, you're starting to see some the first leading edge of fall. And so Prescott Valley, I think these newer subdivisions, they really need some help because they're putting those cinder block walls up, you know, five foot, and all of a sudden it feels like a Russian prison yard, not a not a secret garden. It's a, I know it's the privacy. We're trying to break things up. It cuts the wind, but you need to really soften that up or it can feel it adds to that dirty dusty, it just doesn't feel right. And so a few vines growing up there, or a few shrubs kind of growing up in the corners, helping you to soften that up. So it feels like a secret garden all of a sudden. You can turn that into a real asset if you strategize how to pull that off. It's kind of a challenge to, to garden well in those yards because they're small, they're tight, and they're, they're block walls. But you can do this, and we'll show you some vines that really go. I have three handouts for you. Two are on ground covers, uh, and vines, I think, can be used as a ground cover. In fact, that's how you see uh, uh, this, this vine here. This is Virginia creeper. Let me see if I can pull this over. It's one of the first ones to, to, to turn color. This is the native one. It just started turning this week, and I think it's turning early because the days, it's been so cloudy, it's not as bright. And so normally it'd be the end of this month. Now it's the first part of the month. It's starting to turn color. So it's the one that announces, oh, fall is here. Yay, cooler temperatures. Um, this grows wild out in the Bradshaws and Mingus Mountains. You'll just see it out there. And it's a ground cover. Underneath the junipers, underneath the oaks, you'll see it just growing. Uh, the beauty with this is animals do not like it. So if you've got javelina and deer or antelope and pack rats and things that eat your yard, this is the one you want to go with. And once it gets established, it can be completely on its own. It is deciduous. That is, it will lose its leaves in the winter. So that's deciduous. Lose its, there's deciduous trees, deciduous vines, deciduous shrubs. It's deciduous. We came up with some new ones. It's so hardy. Uh, we have one called April Showers. It's got a variegated leaf to it. So you've seen a pattern. It's got not just green, also got a, a light variegation to it. Turns the same fall color, so probably in a couple weeks, this will start to have this really bright red. And right after that, the euonymus, the uh, burning bush. This is a bush goes about 
I don't know, head high or so, beautifully shaped, has, it's almost like it's on like steroids with lights and it almost glows it in the dark. It's so red, it's very pretty. It does really, really well here. So they're kind of tied together. So they're one of those, um, so one of those fall colored shrubs. So 20% of your yard should be spring bloomers. 20% should be summer bloomers. So you're, you're, someone mentioned, um, was it uh, uh, Rosa Sharon or something? It had fallen over, it had gotten so waterlogged. So that's a summer bloomer. Roses, I think, can be a spring and summer and fall. Roses are amazing up here. Uh, then you want 20% of your fall colored. You want 20% of your plants dedicated to fall color. That's, this would be in that, that realm. Okay, that's your maples, uh, your, your Virginia creepers, uh, burning bush. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, Emmer maples, there's a bunch of them. And then you want 20% dedicated to evergreens. These are the anchors that hold the landscape so that you've always got something looking really good, even in the dead of winter. That's your spruce trees. Uh, some of these will be evergreens. I'll show you what those are, uh, but 20%. So that's spring, summer, fall, winter, 80% covered. The other 20%, just for fun, do whatever. It makes you happy. Just add to it. If you're a gardener, just come to the garden center. It'd be, be giddy when you see something new. Go plant that. Or if you summer here and you winter down in Phoenix, add it to your summer mix. So you have more things in bloom. If you winter here from, let's say, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and you're wintering here, well, then add more winter stuff just so it looks good. So add that to whatever you want. So that's kind of the fluff factor. Um, if you like yellow, add more yellow flowers. If you like whatever that is. So that's the mix. True native, once you get going, what I would do with this, I plant it, I put it on drip irrigation, I'd root it out for a couple of years, and then I would cut the irrigation off of it and just let it go by itself. It'll be that easy. If you're going this up a fence, this will self cling to a rock wall, that kind of stuff, or it'll climb up a trellis work, something like that. It'll climb up a pergola, it'll climb up a, an arch. Um, then I would just cut it off the irrigation and just let it go by itself. What I'll do in the, for fences, this is with all the vines, is late winter, early, early spring, like uh, uh, into February, first part of March, I'll shave this thing down as close as I can to the chain link or to the fence or to the, to the, to the trellis. I'll just cut it, usually with my hedgers, cut it right back and I butcher it and I fertilize it. That way I get fresh new growth coming out every spring. This is really important for your, your blooming kind of plants like honeysuckle, uh, trumpet vine, big red flowers. We'll show you those in a sec. So that's a way to kind of maintain them. Otherwise they'll tend to grow up a fence and they'll grow easily to the top of the fence in a year, pretty easily. They're gonna grow eight foot wide and they're gonna keep getting wider and wider and wider they almost get, they almost flow over the fence and it looks wild almost. You can keep it a little bit cleaner, neater, and it blooming more by simply trimming it back every year. And you don't have to be sophisticated, just whack on it. The reason I do it late winter is it can look a little rough uh, when you get done because you just, you just butchered it. You just whacked it way back, back to the fence line or whatever that was. And so it looks a little rough, but it's about to start growing in March. So I'll cut it back right before it's about to take off with new growth. So it doesn't look as bad for very long. It only looks bad for a couple of weeks instead of in, in uh, you know, December. Now you've got three months when it looks kind of rough. So I'm timing a lot of that to, to uh, so it looks, it looks worse, shorter times. I do that with my red to potinia, uh, the, the hedging kind of plants. You know, they get real woody sometimes. You want to trim it back. So I'll cut it back right before I know it's going to start growing in March. So I'll cut it back the first part of March. And it's got that fresh red new growth coming up just, just a few weeks later. So it doesn't look as rough as long. So timing is, is important. Sun or shade. It natively grows in the shade. Thank you very much. Um, it will take full sun. It's pretty versatile up here. It likes growing here. It likes clay soil. It likes wind. It, it likes bright sun. It likes Arizona. It's an Arizona plant. If I were to call it, this is a Virginia creeper. I wouldn't call it Virginia creeper. I would call this an Arizona creeper. I think it's a better, I think there's a better name, but 
I think Virginia grows throughout the country at, at this uh, zone seven kind of area. So it's a really good one. This is one you're seeing grow right now. Um, you're seeing it in bloom. It's got a big red flower about this big, that long, and hummingbirds just love it. They can't resist it. Uh, you'll see a lot of these you have by college in commercial settings because it's so robust. It can be a little aggressive. This, thing's, this thing will grow easily six, eight feet. It's kind of like a grape. It'll grow and grow and grow. And the more it grows, the more flowers you get. Super hardy. I don't think I would take this off the irrigation. I would keep it on irrigation to increase the flowers. Once it's in bloom, it tends to use some more moisture. It could probably go all by itself like, it, like a Virginia creeper, but the trumpet vine will bloom longer if you take care for it a little bit more. So I'll keep that one on the irrigation. I'll treat it like a tree. Water it once a week. It's probably plenty in June when it's 95 and it's prevailing southwest wind that's dry as can be. Probably once a week is fine with this. It's perfectly fine with that. Great one for growing up pergolas and arches, that kind of stuff. That's where you see a lot of it. Uh, Wisteria is the one that's the most famous. I think more in the east and Midwest areas. Wisteria does grow here. I don't think it blooms as long as other parts of the country because it's blooming when it's still real dry and windy. Uh, I think this one does the same thing and looks better longer than even than Wisteria does. You two gals are gonna ask a lot of questions, aren't you? Go for it. <laughs> um, so is it dog friendly? Both of these, are they dog? Because animals don't eat these. Why don't animals eat these? It's because they've got poison, they got not poison, they've got some taste to them that they really don't like. And so they'll eat them. I don't think a dog, I've never heard of a dog eating that. I think if they did, they would eat it and throw it up and be fine. Uh, what I'm legally supposed to tell you is check with your veterinarian. So I leave my back door open, but I think you'd be fine. So puppies are the strange ones because they'll chew on it when they're teething. They chew, they're too, they're dumb as mud and they, their teeth hurt. They just want to eat stuff. So this is probably the most famous of all of the vining plants here. This is honeysuckle. We have several varieties. In fact, I've got a couple of them. Here's another one here. Ah, it stimulates root growth. It'll be okay. Yeah. Um, not quite in bloom, but it, this is the classic one. Um, you know, as a kid, you had Hall's honeysuckle or Japanese honeysuckle. It was the yellow one. You take the semens out and suck the honey, and it was just real kind of fun to play with. It does exceptionally well here. We grow this up fences across the yard as ground cover. It's just really, it'll grow up a rock face. I say they cut your backyard and you just cut into the rock face. And now you're like sitting there looking at this rock wall. It feels kind of like you're in a cave. This will grow right up there, make it feel like it's like alive and growing. So plant one at the base and it'll just grow up. What I would do is I'd plant this and I would take these stakes off. Then I would fan it out and train it. I'd pin it to the ground or tie it to the, to the fence. So it's growing. You have to train these or they'll become wild. Force it to grow in the direction that you want to grow it. It'll look more manicured, more uh, trained. Uh, and then again, this one I would shave right back. This is semi-evergreen. So most years it's got foliage on it. If we go sub-zero some year, it does tend to go deciduous. That is, it'll lose its leaves. That is so rare that that happens that mostly we'll call this semi-evergreen or, or evergreen. If it's a mild winter, it'll keep its foliage. I do find that it, it benefits from being cut back every once in a while. Otherwise, it can tend to grow over itself. Let's say if it's a ground cover, it'll quickly grow over itself and, and it gets real woody underneath, but it'll be nice and green on top. Um, it doesn't affect the growth so much, but just cleanliness kind of keeps it looking more manicured in your yard. And so I just take, I just whack it, fertilize it, and then it comes back with a vengeance. Up a vine, uh, up a uh, fence or something, I'll try to trim it back to within no, six or eight inches, whatever is comfortable. I'll just shave it, shave it back there, fertilize it, and then uh, it comes back, it just blooms and blooms. Uh, a pollinator, definitely butterflies, uh, bumblebees, hummingbirds love honeysuckle. And the animals seem to leave it alone. 
So deer, deer are a problem in some areas, especially that wildland interface where you get the forest right there. Deer are coming up and down your, or, or javelina. Packs of them will come through the yard. They seem to leave this one alone. So it's, that's the one we put out there in designs where it's got the possibility of animals eating it. We'll put honeysuckle in because they don't eat it. Yeah. Oh. Oh, this one. Yep. Do you know why? So she's got honeysuckle and it hasn't done well. We're trying to figure out why. We might talk offline. We can we can show you. I could tell you how to get that to go. But my first thing that comes to mind is maybe mildews because it's been so wet. Powdery mildew. It'll cause it to, if it gets too much water, because this is a drought hardy plant. So I would say if you overwater this, like more than maybe twice a week, it would not be happy. It'll get, it'll be, literally be drunk with water. So literally just fall over. You're seeing that quite a bit with the uh, Russian sage right now. Certain like summer bloomers, they're getting so much moisture, they're just falling over in the gardens going, I just can't take it anymore. They're like in the Kirk gutters, just drunk as can be because they're not used to that much moisture. These are drought hardy plants. And so as soon as they dry out, they kind of go boink, pop right back up. I, I'm guessing that could be some of the issue too, all the moisture that we've had. Honeysuckle does really well. If in doubt, fertilize this. I don't know if I brought the right fertilizer. I did. This is your fertilizer. I keep saying fertilize. If you want things to grow fast, use this all purpose plant food. It's a granular food around the outer edges of that where the roots are, and it will promote new growth. So I cut back my akebia. I've got a five leaf akebia. It's a specialty vine. It was just overgrown this space. It was, it was not welcome anymore. I either had to dig it out or cut it back until it got back under control. So my wife goes, what'd you do? I'm going, I, it was taken over. I don't, I want it to look more garden-esque, not wild back here. And so I cut it back like three weeks ago, gave it some of this, and now it looks like a brand new manicured plant. It's just, you can, you can feed your way out of a lot of mistakes, especially early in spring. That yeah. Where's the best lawn food ever? It's got, it's got the bird guano in it. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. It's got a, probably got a, so he's got grass. You folks online, I know you're there. Tune in. We appreciate that. If you could take just a moment, hit the like button, hit the subscribe, make a comment, because uh, that really helps us out as a small company to be seen. So to kind of get her, Google doesn't like us. They like the analytics kind of fight us, but you can change all of that. We appreciate that. Plus we want you in here. Come into the garden center. What are you doing behind that computer screen? Anyway, get in here. I know we'll see you this afternoon. I apologize. Yeah. Anyway, so we see a lot of folks. We'll have this many people online watching at the same time. It's kind of fun to see how things change. Um, this is a great lawn food. My guess for your lawn, the reason you got brown spots, I'm seeing this in quite a few lawns. Uh, uh, there's, there's called, it's called dollar spot. There's a fungal thing that gets onto grasses. It starts eating the, the, the root level. You'll see this ring start growing, this brown spot start growing. No matter fertilizer can change it. You need to get a fungicide. I would probably use revitalize, especially if you have dogs. Revitalize is a great uh, fungal thing, uh, copper fungicide. There's several of them like that. Uh, but I would fertilize it. It'll grow its way out of it, but you need to control that fungus. And there's lots of growing season left for grass. I mean, grass will grow through November. And so this thing can get worse and worse for the next two, three months. So kind of get ahead of it just so it's solved up. Yeah. It's growing. Yeah. Still a fungal thing. It's because of all the moisture. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And grasses get, I'm telling you that, without seeing a plug, I, I'm just guessing because of all the moisture and all of the leaf spotting, leaf diseases I've seen, it's because the moisture is causing a lot of these things that we haven't seen for a while. But I'm glad that we do now. So there's, there's solutions for it, but it just means we've had a lot of moisture. So uh, the other one too, don't water at night for your lawn. Water early morning. Make sure it gets dry going through the evening. That'll help. 
control it some. So honeysuckles do really great. Animals don't eat it. Full sun. The more sun you give this, the more flowers you're going to get. So I'd say at least six hours of sun for this or more. So to full day. I mean, in the Pika, what's the longest day? June 27th? It's, it's like winter, summer solstice, blistering hot, and then take a blow dryer to it and it'll be happy. It'll be, it'll be happy with that, okay? Honeysuckle likes growing here. Different colors. We're always trying to introduce new colors because it's so, it's so good. It so, grows so well here. Uh, the Hall's honeysuckle is the one that's most evergreen. The purples, the lemonades, some of the others are more deciduous, but they got the pretty new color flowers to them. So you got to kind of figure out which one you want. Uh, the other one for shade, and then we'll move to some ground covers. Um, ivy does great. It's amazing. It's a weed. I mean, it's a weed. The difference, the reason I brought this one was, um, it likes the shade. It'll take a lot of sun, but it doesn't. In other parts of the country, it grows in full sun, not here. I mean, it will, but it's kind of beat up. It gets brown. I mean, it'll live, but it won't look good. You won't like it. If you keep it out of that midday sun, that 10 to 2 in the middle of summer, it will look better. So for me, I grow this in a container, a big pot. It's been in there for years, uh, and, and I have it underneath my deck facing north. It never sees the light of day ever. But it was this dark corner underneath the deck. It's, we entertain back there. The, the grill and the, 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 the spas and the, the fire pits are all back there. So I didn't want this. I needed something that was living there to, to soften this up. And ivy was a solution. And I put it on a structure. So I've got a ball. I've got one at the front door that has a double ball to it. So just, and I train it to be this real pretty topiary thing. The one in the back is on a, on a pyramidal structure. Pick a structure that you like or just put a stake in it. Either way, but they do really well with pruning. I cut it back. If I get these long runners, I'll just take it and cut it back, back to the structure. I don't let it get out of control. If you let it go, it's, these are self-clinging. I thought I saw some roots. They'll actually form roots. Yeah, you're seeing some roots right here. It'll actually touch something attach itself and keep keep crawling up. This will crawl up the side of buildings. So it'll grow through through the wall if you let it. So it's a weed. So it does really well. It's got a real waxy uh, leaf to it, which makes it very drought hardy. Um, so it really does well here. I grow up walls. I've got it several places that uh, kind of up, up uh, I've got a negative edged kind of huge patio. It's as wide as the house and it's a big house. It's that wide. And the negative edge, I didn't want to put a railing up there because I'm overlooking the dells. I wanted to be able to, to see this, this, uh, this, the view, the vistas. And so I put containers right there to kind of keep the grandkids from hurling themselves off the edge. Okay, you got to have some safety there. But this big wall that's, that's holding, that's getting the, the patio up to level, it's just stark. And so I used vines right there. And I don't even know if it's getting watered anymore. It's so, it's adapted so well that it just clings to the wall and just climbs up and it makes it all soft. It looks like an English garden almost, and I hardly care for it. So there's a place for ivy. Just don't plant it in full sun and you'll be happier. Give it some protection. It'll take, I would say up to six, seven hours of sun a day. So it'll take a lot of sun. It'll take that west exposure that's hot in the end of the day. It'll do that and be just fine. It'll be beautiful. I just would keep it out of that midday in, in the middle of uh, in the middle of summer. Evergreen um, animals don't bother it. It's kind of a good one. If you want to keep it contained, put it in a pot. That way you can control. I do the same thing with this one. This is a, a um, this is organic mint. Mints do really really well here. They're amazing. They're fragrant. They 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 take some traffic. Uh, they trail over walls. They, they go in between rocks and boulders. Um, and then you can eat, you can like add them to, I think this is spearmint. So mojitos every night of the year. So you can have that. It does that well. So I'll, uh, many times I'll put mint to control it in a pot or someplace where I can just go, you, you're allowed to grow here and nowhere else or I'm coming after you. So I, I've got one of these underneath my front faucet at the front of the house. 
it only gets water when the hose kind of leaks out and has some water to it. That's the only time. And it's happy there. So it keeps the control where it only gets watered here. So it tries to escape. There's no water. There's nothing out there for you. It's only right here. And so there's ways to treat that. I also grow a chocolate mint at the bottom of the driveway where all the stuff from your car and your tires or the kids' cars, there's the ones that always, or the kids' friends' cars always leak stuff in your driveway. <laughs> then it gathers down here. I want to filter that out before it goes downstream. And so I use mint because it'll take that kind of abuse. I don't eat it. I don't use it. It's just pretty. And so it filters out all that water and gunk that, that comes off the driveway. So there's ways to kind of use it. I don't water that. The driveway gets enough water to kind of keep it going. Um, and then it, when, it, when it wants to get out of control, it still wants to escape. Um, I'll just pull it up, you know, get these runners, pull it right up and keep it back under control. And once a year, I'll probably take a lawnmower and just go, and I'm done. So it's a really good ground. People don't think of, you know, mint, strawberries, a ground cover, um, ground cover um, rosemary does really well here. It's really pretty. This is tall as it gets, then it spreads like this will be, this will grow out easily five, six feet. So, but it only gets this tall. It gets blue flowers, usually in March, and it'll bloom again, late summer, early fall. So it's got two bloom cycles because it really likes growing up here. But a lot of folks don't think of rosemary as a, as a landscape shrub, but it really does well. The secret with the, with the, with the ground cover varieties of rosemary, so there's probably 20 different varieties. We have a heavy influence from Phoenix. Those varieties down there don't winter over up here. Make sure you're planting the right variety. So, or just buy them from Waters Garden Center and we're only gonna sell the one that grows up here. So, but some mistakes have been made. So some, I bought it from Costco or from a box store um, and then it died. I'm a bad gardener. It's not you. You were sold the wrong plant that never intended to actually live to the winter here. Should have never even been up in these box stores. They should have stayed down in that flatlands of Phoenix where they belong. Up here, you want to make sure you get the right varieties. So just kind of a word of warning sometimes. So trailing. This I actually planted the front edge of my raised beds. And it just trails over. It gets it real soft looking. I would say this needs at least six hours of sun or more to really do well. Put it in the hot spots. If you've got dark chocolate rock, front yard you use to kind of keep the weeds down, it would take that heat coming off of that, that dark colored rock and soften it and kind of grow out amongst that and be just fine. It'll grow over the rock. Yep. I don't think it'll climb. I don't think it climbs so much, but it'll go through, let's say boulders. It's real pretty growing through. It'll grow over the gravel type rocks yeah, easily. Yep. Yep. And soften it. So this one root, so you put your emitter right here it'll turn into this great big, beautiful, green, evergreen, you know, uh, you can use it in the kitchen. Usually the upright ones they're, they're using, but it's the same flavor, same honeysuckle. Yeah, it smells good, yum. <laughs> so another one that's used like that are these, and just thinking outside the box, um, like trailing, sedums. I brought this kind of as a, as a lesson for the Southern Californians. You're used to your succulents, but a lot of them are tropical. That is, they, they grow really well in the summer, but then they die in the winter. So you gotta be careful with that up here because you can still find those. We sell them as annuals or house plants or offices. They'll use those annual varieties. We try to warn folks, this is not, to be, this is not meant to be wintered over here. You wanna bring it indoors. These love winter. They're they're zones eight, seven, six, five. These are zone, these are, these will take the cold. These will go down to zero degrees easy and look green year round. I put them in pots sometimes. These will actually get long tendrils that trail down. Um, they'll get two, three feet long and just kind of dangle there. They're really pretty. They get a little kind of fluorescent flower to them in the spring typically, but really you're planting them up for the flower. You're putting them, you're, you're playing with the textures, the colors. They're both exactly the same. Give them full sun. I would say at least six hours again or more, and they're going to thrive for you. The negative is they don't take traffic very well. So if you've got a lot of foot traffic, you're trying to walk over them. Dogs are always playing on them. Probably not the best choice. 
these are meant to kind of, they break. Good thing is when they break, wherever they land, they'll start growing over there. So they just kind of, they're kind of like a cactus in that, that regard. They'll just keep growing and growing. So they'll run across a, a rock lawn, touch the ground, and they'll start rooting there, and they'll just kind of keep moving across the yard or the garden. So good choice. If you really want a lot of traffic, probably the number one selling ground cover is this. Anyone know what this is? Vinca, it's a weed, total weed, uh, but it loves growing here. So don't put this in the middle of your garden or this is all you'll have within two years. Put it on the outer edges where it gets neglected and where you can kind of keep it under control. It's kind of like mint. Put it where you'd put mint, in a container to keep it controlled or out of the edges. But it does trail. You can put this at the front edge of a, of, a, of a raised bed. It'll flow over. It's got these pretty blue flowers to it, size of a quarter. There is a place for this. We've got, uh, this is Vinca Minor. It's got the smaller leaf to it. It's the one that does better in more shaded areas. I've also got Vinca Major, the bigger leafed, very aggressive. One fact, we've got the one down there that's variegated. It's really pretty. I use that underneath my juniper tree. Uh, it's hard to grow things under junipers because they're always throwing litter off. And that litter is that, that the, the foliage it drops poisons the soil. It puts uh, arsenic or something in there. It does something. It's defending its turf so nothing can take its water and food underneath this. It's very defensive. It doesn't want anything to grow here except it. So it's hard to grow underneath juniper trees, big alligator, big sh shaggy bark junipers. This one actually thrives with that and blooms and grows. It looks really, really good. So yeah. So, your, your juniper's down? Yeah, because allergies from, yeah, yeah. Um, so no. It, it should, once you cut that juniper, so her question was, if, if you cut down the juniper, is the soil tainted forever? No. It's mainly only while it's, it's throwing off the, the, the litter coming from, and you know, they can be kind of trashy sometimes. They're always throwing stuff off. So you kind of want them out there and kind of let them do their own thing. You don't want them right next to your patio or you'll be having to blow that thing off daily. Ponderosas can be the same way though. Big old eight, eight inch long ponderosa needles always, they always drop something. And now they're in their pine cone phase. So now they're throwing needles and so you just get used to, if you're in the forest, you just get used to raking those up and, and having a compost pile someplace. So this will this will adapt really well to that. Where was I at? I'm trying to, in my head, I'm trying to go through the sequence. Yeah. Yep. Too much water, yeah. So your leaves are turning brown on some of these. What I would do, this is another one that really benefits, uh, like in March, into February, first part of March, get, get past Valentine's. I would just mow this thing right to the ground with a lawnmower, or weed whacker, just whack it as close as you can, fertilize it with that all-purpose plant food, and it'll help you have a fresh, you have more fresh new, these bright, bright colored uh, leaves and more flowers you did that. So they can be overgrown sometimes. And then you get, um, guessing you've got some water and fungal things like with the lawn. I'm thinking that same thing is going after your vinca. Just clean it up this winter, fertilize, kind of come back. Let's go to the bright hot sun stuff, which was, let's do, let's do shade. So ground cover shade things. Because there are some spots, there's a lot of gardens with a lot of shade, especially matured, yeah. Oh, so, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, where, do I have that up here? Well, where is it? Oh, thank you. Oh, we'll start with you. Just take that pen. I have three handouts for you. One is on ground covers. So I've got these plus more. It'll tell you how to grow them, where to grow them, how much sun, how much wind, how they adapt here. So I've got a list for you of these and several more. I've got two of those, those lists for you. And it's just for you folks and, and, and online, look inside the comment field and you'll see a link to those. And so you all have the link here very shortly if you put your email down. If you don't want that, don't put your email down. Uh, you could go to our website, there's a search bar. You can type in vines or ground covers. Our, our website is not a, a still site, it's, a, it's an encyclopedia of garden content. So I write two garden columns a week. It gets thrown up there, we do videos, all kinds of stuff. 
the class will be up there. So it's meant to help you be a better gardener. But I wanted three things for you. I've got the fastest growing annual vines, which kind of, I wrote an article uh, this early spring and it got rave reviews. And so I thought, oh, the gardeners might like that. You may not, might not want to grow those right now, uh, but those fancy beans, fancy, you know, uh, passion vines, things that are annuals that grow really fast and really pretty. It's a list of those and then some others. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the class handouts for you. Start with, uh, thank you, Ken, for reminding me on that. I get in the zone, I just totally forget. Shade. This is one you wouldn't think is so tough. This is mainly grown on the East Coast. This is U, Y-E-W, U. Usually you've got Hicks U's. They have columnar kind of upright things, but this is a spreading U. It's evergreen, has little red berries, but because it's so waxy, it's so sturdy, it loves growing in our, our dry climate and will take our alkaline water and not even flinch. It really likes growing here. So I'll grow you on my, on, on my north side shaded gardens. Even in my native gardens, I treat it like a native, but because it's so waxy leafed um, and because it's, it's in the shade, it doesn't dry out. So it really likes getting watered once a week, once every 10 days, once every 14 days. I think I remember to water it sometimes, I try. It still grows. Uh, animals do not bother this. For the puppies, I think the vet would say, don't plant you. Uh, they, they don't want to chew on them. What I found is I have puppies and I have ewes and I've never had them eat it. Or if they do, they get sick, throw up, and they're going, I shouldn't eat that anymore. And they just don't do it anymore. So the amount of you you'd have to eat would be ridiculous. Um, the berries, probably don't let the berries, don't, don't eat the berries because they're poisonous too. The great thing is if you're in the forest, they're kind of like rhododendrons. They're super tough and nothing eats them. So they just, the, a, a pack of mule deer coming in, they're not gonna bother these. I've had them down in Skull Valley there. We have elk, we had a herd of 15 elk that would come down every, every day and water on Kirkland Creek. We had a farm right on Kirkland Creek. And so the elk would come in, they're basically cows with long legs and they mow down stuff, it's, a, it's ridiculous. They don't bother these. So it's a good one for those, those pack rats aren't gonna bother this. Ground squirrels aren't gonna bother this. So, so ground cover you, it gets this big, this tall, and then it spreads probably eight to 10 feet, something like that. So it's gonna go this big pretty easily. So in the shaded area, it's pretty good. You could hedge it if you got it next to, let's say a, a patio, you want some softness right next to the patio before you get out to the rock out there. This would be a good room for that. You could just trim it, don't let it grow into the patio. So you, I use this one a lot. I have a lot of colors of this. Uh, your grandparents called this coral bells, uh, but, but really what your, the, all the garden magazines are calling it hookera. So hookera is, the, is a common name for it anymore. Hookera, H-E-U-C-H-O, I don't know, just look and photograph the tag later. Um, so lots of colors on this. I brought this lighter color as a lesson in the shaded areas. There's lots of green. But in a shaded area, this is hard. This just is more dark. It's more darkness, more shadowy. So it doesn't pick up a lot. The red berries are pretty. The new growth is bright green. So it's got some things going on with it. But in a dark corner, bright colors really show up and add brightness, kind of add liveliness to that part of the garden. I plant these at the base of my trees and I put them on the emitter where the tree is. They're so tough that they'll take the same water cycle that your tree does and, and thrive. And it's a perennial, it comes back year after year after year, it just gets bigger, bolder. So I usually will put a couple of them on either side of the tree and then I have this beautiful hookera ground cover. It looks like the tree is growing up through this life. It just is a good look. Whereas rock right next to your trunk, that's not natural. That's, that's unnatural. Having underplanting is what that is. Uh, looks, looks, I think, more garden-esque. So that's how I treat that one. So really tough plant. Evergreen most years, um, it'll keep some foliage. I do find it, it does really well by whacking on it in late, late February, first part of March. I'll just cut it right back, fertilize it, so it can have fresh new foliage coming up. Otherwise, it can get hail damage. They just get beat up some. I want fresh new foliage on it instead of old 
last year's foliage. So I'll just clean it, clean it up every year. Every usually late winter, early spring. That's why I do most of my pruning. Okay, hookra comes in chocolate, reds, greens, variegated. They're just fun. There's probably a dozen varieties down there. I brought one, mainly gold, just as that lesson for in the darker areas of the garden. Look at golds. I'll go to this gold. I use this one a lot. This is juniper, and juniper gets a bad rap. Get this out of the way. Yeah. Juniper gets a bad rap, but they grow native here. We have huge juniper forests, and the varieties that we're growing, it's, it's the males that are the problem. They cause all of your grief. The pollen is put off by the male junipers. Females do not have allergy issues. They don't try to pollinate the world. If you see a male juniper kind of try to pollinate the entire mountainside, pretty much. He'll literally just explode with pollen and just take, he wants to pollinate every single female on that hillside. And then they're the females are the ones that put the berries on. So you can, you can tell now, if you walk through the forest, that's a male, that's a female. The ones with berries have the, the big, pretty, sexy ones with the pretty berries that they dangle and decorate. Those are females. The males are starting to turn yellow. They get kind of off colored in winter because they're loading up on pollen. So we just breed the females. So that's all we're gonna sell. All of our junipers are not going to add to your allergy issues. The reason I like gold, this is old gold juniper. The reason I like these, or I guess this is a sea of gold juniper. I've got a real dark, I, I use dark rock or I have dark, dark ground. And so if you put more green or blue against a dark back, dark rock that you're using, those mocha chocolate colors that are so popular, um, they just blend right in with more rock. And it's like, I just have more of the same out there. But if you put a contrasting color, the light gold, it just really pops and brings the entire garden out. So if I strategize where I put these around in the backyard and they're, they're, they're now about, I don't know, from me to you wide, round. They take up a lot of space really great at holding hillsides, uh, er, um, erosion control. If you had a big steep slope, what I would do is I'd plant these. Let's give you a quick lesson on that. So let's say you got a slope. How am I gonna draw this? So a lot of folks will try to dig out an area and plant that plant right here. What I would suggest, it looks more natural, is if you plant it right here, and take on the same direction. And so here's your plant with the slope and I'll put the emitter on the upside hill. So it's watering down this way into the root ball. And now it does, your hillside doesn't look so ruffled. It looks like it's more contoured, like it's natural, yet you can still water it. Also the other secret, now we're talking irrigation. So hydraulics are kind of funky. Water, it's very heavy, it's kind of, it's hard to push. Um, when you're running run your irrigation up to this uh, hill, so some of you have big hills, some of you have really ridiculous hills, and so do I over there. Um, run your irrigation along, the, along this way. Don't run it up and down the hill or the pressure on the water will gain at the bottom of the hill. It'll be very high pressure at the top, of the, it'll be very low pressure. So you get no, you'll get no consistency out of your drip emitters. Does that make sense? So run it sideways, horizontally. Don't go up and down the hill. Just, this is like irrigation, like 501. It's advanced irrigation, but that's kind of how you do that. So that makes sense, keep on. The, the other one, just while we're on this, let's say, you, let's say this is our hill. Let's use the same. So we're looking up this, let's say it's a 18 degree slope going up. You might have riprap, those ankle busting like rocks. You kind of stack on top of each other to hold the hill in. Um, you, so you kind of want some plants in there to soften it up so it doesn't look like just rock. Many times we'll plant a vine up here and we'll train it to grow down. We'll put a vine down here. We'll, let's say this is the vine. We'll train it to go up. So it's almost easier to plant at the top or bottom of the hill than in the middle because you'll, you'll hurt yourself by planting here. Just plant it here and get a vine and force it, take it off the stakes and force it, pin it to the ground and force it to grow up and down that hillside. That's really effective for let's say 10, 12, 15 foot high, like hills. 
If it's really tall, you might have to commit to putting some things in the middle, but I think you can use vines to your advantage to fill that thing in. And within a year or two, that's gonna be solid vines up and down there, whether it's any of these vines we've mentioned. If you're using shrubs, the mistake I found, this is design, now we're into design. So don't plant shrubs straight across in a line like this. And then you're, yes, it will grow out and they'll all get this big. All these we're gonna show you. Really it's better to plant, this, this is not natural. Straight lines in nature is not natural. That's a, that's a formal garden. That's how they do it in London or the East Coast. They got the boxwoods and they just line them right to the front door and they just, they, they trim them, they Dr. Seuss them, but they don't let them go naturally. Here we have, we have, we don't do that type of, of design. Here we have more natural designs. So it's better to, to go in triangular patterns. So I would plant one in between and I would just do it like this. And now they'll fill in and, and look more natural but you'll still be able to get that irrigation across the hill effectively to that plant. Does it make sense? It's more than I wanted to go. I teach a whole class on just design, another one on just irrigation. But there's some, some quick things that can help you up your game really quick and not make a mistake. Can you see that on, on the camera okay? Is that okay? Is that okay, folks? All right, give me a thumbs up. Will you hit the like button, subscribe. Okay, so there you go. I brought this just going, the most popular colors are like this. This is Arizona blue. This is as tall as it gets, and this will spread out. And you can see it's starting to run already. It's really happy. So, and then you can plant things. You don't have to commit. You can plant them. They look good together. So they can design. What I would do if you're doing that, you've got big areas, I would plant in odd numbers. So three, five, sevens. Don't plant in, in even numbers. So it'll look more natural again. And I put them in, think triangular patterns. Think groupings, think islands. That'll help you. So kind of zigzag, zig, you got a big rock lawn. You kind of want to soften it up. You got a couple trees and a boulder. You kind of need a little bit more. I would just put a couple, just zigzag them along the edge. Pick the color that you like. And they'll fill in and be, look really pretty within just a season. Then once these get going, they can almost go on their own. So they're so tough, so robust. So junipers do really well. Again, doesn't do pollen. This is a female. That's why she looks so good. And you only find females at water, good looking plants at Waters Garden Center. You heard me, right? Okay. This is probably the most popular. Grandparents grew these, grew this one. This is Buffalo Juniper. I get bored with this when I put my kids through college, just selling this one juniper. Um, it's pretty. This is Calgary carpet. It's the replacement for this. You can see it's got a, even a more layered, more uh, fl a flat, carpety kind of look to it. So this will spread out six, eight feet, and it just has this look over the entire six, eight feet. It's really pretty. Junipers don't flow over things very well. They don't tend to like, like a vine. They don't like this, uh, like this uh, vinca. It'll kind of grow and then trail over and through rocks, that kind of stuff. So for raised beds, this might be better. Um, these are better out in the yard because they, they're more upright. They're just, they're cheerier in the sun. At least six hours of sun. If you could give it 24 seven sun, it would be happier. It'll grow even faster. So it likes sun, hot, bright sun on the hilltop. Some of you have these beautiful Vista homes that the wind just is harsh. It's gonna take that and be just fine. I find these are really pretty. Uh, if you've got boulders, you've placed some rocks, or you just up in the boulders, it's really pretty at, at, at trailing in between the rocks. It'll take that reflective heat and, and adapt really well to that, and it just keeps looking good year-round. Evergreen just looks good. looks like this all year. Okay. A companion to that, I'll use this one quite a bit. It's not known. It's, it's kind of one of these unique Southwest kind of plants, but it's a cotonias or cotton easter. That's how you spell it. Some of these grow wild in the uh, forest. You'll see a gray leaf cotoneaster. I didn't bring that one up here because it's more of a shrub, but it's a cousin to this. This is a ground cover. It gets this tall and then it just, it just has these big long tendrils that kind of grow out. This will easily grow between you and me that wide. Uh, so it'll go easily six feet or more. Has pretty white flowers in the spring. It's evergreen in the winter. 
Those white flowers turn into red berries through fall and winter. It's got a lot going on for it. So it's a good, good plant. So cotoneasters, and they companion plant, they take the same light, same water, same everything as, as, as this, junipers. So we'll frequently put a block of these over here and then a block of these over here. And they take, they take the same maintenance, same water, same everything. Animals don't eat this. It looks delicious. Like I want some ranch dressing and kind of dip a little myself, but they just don't, they don't eat it. So they don't bother this. And I don't think it's poisonous to animal. It's just, I know you're going to, you're thinking that. So I think you would be okay. These two are great ground covers. Again, I just picked a few kind of getting some different colors, how to design with them. Um, these we use a lot for erosion control because there's their roots are so, so massive. This is Euonymus, but it also is called winter creeper is its common name because in the winter it holds its foliage, but it turns this real bright purpley color. It's very dramatic, very pretty color. And then the, this is its new growth spring and summer. So it has this transition. So it's not truly ever gold or, or ever whatever color this is, silver. These are variegated. We've also got straight, straight up green, but for darker, darker rock, for if you've got crushed granite, that lighter gold, and so there's way to, ways to pick the colors so that they look really good. These will run. Again, this is as tall as it gets, but you've seen the runners. Oops, oops. You've seen the runners kind of run this way. We have to actually trim these back because they just want to they just want to grow right now. They want to they want to they want to triple in size right now. And we want to keep them kind of tight, neat looking. And so we trim them back probably once a month. So bright sun. Uh, yes. Oh, so her, for those who are online or over here, she has some euonymus and they're just sitting there mocking her as a gardener. They're personally insulting her because they're not growing. I get that, sum it up, right? That's gonna be a soil issue. So when you're planting, maybe do we get enough time for that? Maybe, maybe we got enough time, but, but when you're planting, do not take shortcuts. Don't, not that you took a shortcut, but, but don't just throw them in the ground. They won't, or they'll just do what you just described over and over. I've had that several do that to me. But if there's a soil that's real hard, it's not draining, it's maybe tainted with some, the contractor threw some of that leftover concrete slush over there. You just never know what's in that soil. Uh, the way you really want to do it is dig that hole up, throw out any rocks that are, that are bigger than a golf ball. So screen it. Some of your some of you dig in your, your garden, you just have boulders. So you big old rocks uh, and everything in between. Out in Prescott Valley, we had these potatoes. Every time it rained, they would just come up their size of potatoes, rocks, they just emerge out of the earth. Just They just float. I don't know how rocks float, but in Prescott Valley, rocks float. And so they just come up. You want to get those things out of your root zone. Then you want to amend. We all need to add extra organics in our soil. And I have a feeling we need to add some more. For that one, I would actually probably get a bag of, of Waters uh, Premium Mulch. I need to put around the edge just to kind of have, it'll activate the worms, mycorrhizal colonies, trying to re enliven the soil. Because literally that plant's in dead soil right now. It's not reacting. Could be it's too wet. The rain has made it too soggy. So it's not perking or, or draining fast enough. It could cause that. There's several things, but you'll get it. And if you're not happy, Dig it up, throw it away, come in and get a new plant. <laughs> I know where you can get some of those. That, that happens though. So gardening is, that's gardening. Sometimes you have failures, sometimes they don't grow, some, but that's gardening. That's how you learn. I know. And I would say too, gardeners, since you all are at a very specialized class, ground covers and vines, this is specialized, okay? This isn't for everyone. Um, it's hard to tell gardeners to give up. Some, cause they just, you want to keep trying. You just want to keep, yeah, I can, I can do this. Two strikes and you're out. So try planting a thing in that hole once. And then I would suggest try a different thing if you can, just so you take one variable out. Was it the plant? We're trying to see if that hole works. Try a different thing in that same hole. If it does the same thing, abandon that hole. Don't try to garden there. 
put a big blue pot, grow in a container. If you go three feet over, it doesn't take very far, just a little bit, just, just walk this way and it'll start growing right there. But that hole, I've had some holes in my, this is my personal experience, where it just didn't want to grow things. There's a rock shelf there. There's something in that soil that's, there's a caliche layer that's running through that you don't see. There's something there that's causing that plant to stagnate. And that's, that could be any of those, I don't know. So yes, in the, in the Q and A section of our uh, class, you folks online, we are not ignoring you. If you have a question, please just type it in. We'll, we'll prioritize you, how about that? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Clematis works. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So why did her clematis turn brown and it traveled? It started at the base and it went up to the whole plant. And now it's like, and I've seen your yard. You are a gardener. That would be an insult to me too. Uh, why? So clematis are unusual. We cl Clematis is very well here. It, it, that's one of the great big flower, like blues and reds and whites, typically very fragrant. It's a pretty flower. Uh, it typically likes to grow in the sunlight, but it wants its feet cool and shady. So usually we'll, we'll uh, mulch the, the roots up real heavy, or we'll plant it in the shade area over here, let it grow up the fence or up the, up the patio, up to the light. That's where it really thrives. My guess is we're into that. It's so wet this year. You got a leaf spot, fungal? Really? Gotcha. Huh. Yeah. Let's talk offline a little bit more because it'd just be gardeners guessing a little bit, trying to figure it out. You need to take some variables. Um, my guess is the roots are still alive on your clematis. The top just, just died. So if you want to keep it going, because gardeners, you never want to give up anything. You want to, you want everything to grow. I'd cut it back this winter, middle of winters, cut it back to the ground and see if it will grow back from the roots. And you'll know by April 1 if it's going to come back or if it died completely. You'll know pretty quick. So, yep, I don't know what's going on with your clematis. You'll just have to kind of garden and try to figure it out. Yeah, I don't know why you're stunted, but I know some things happen. I know what to look for to start taking out some of those variables. And that's gardening. That's why it's so social. We're just trying to figure it out together. We can help each other. Anything else? Should we go back to, I think we got enough. We can go for a couple more plants. We're one hour in, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. And I'll hang out for as long as you want. Let me just see what else I brought. So I've covered most of the ground cover things. Some of the things you're seeing that show up late summer, early fall, the fall plants are here. I wanted to show, show them off because you don't see them in spring. You only see them this time of year. And so I'm, I'm dealing with gardeners. You really care about this kind of stuff. And I like talking to gardeners. So one, this is dark night or bluebeard spirea or coreopterus. You can come take a picture of how to spell that. But bluebeard spirea, it has a spirea flower and foliage to it, but they get up about this tall I treat them in like a like a native in my in my gardens. So I'll water it maybe once a week, every ten days or so. I don't I don't overwater it. I don't overcare for it. Just this tidy, neat blue flower that every summer loads up. It's a pollinator, so butterflies and bees and they all like this. They like the taste of the flower, um, and I find that it's much longer lived and much neater than Russian sage. R Russian sage, the other blue, spiky blue kind of shrub, it's up about this high, but it can be kind of weedy. It seeds everywhere. It's short lived. It doesn't it only lives for five, maybe seven years at most. And then it needs to be dug out. And it just gets so ratty, it gets so untidy. It, and it starts seeding everywhere. This one doesn't do that. And it does the same kind of flower sequence, same kind of color. So it's just, uh, again, Blue night or, or blue beard spirea. Animals don't seem to bother it. No, it's fine. Spireas in general, they don't, they don't eat. I don't prune it. I don't do anything to it. I just let it go. It's deciduous. So I just thought it, it just keeps its shape and it comes back next spring. And it blooms every summer. It's out in full sun for me. I would say at least six hours. Again, the definition is for a full sun is six hours or more at this altitude. 
Under six hours are considered part shade to shade. So those are your shadier shade lovers. Over six hours are sun lovers. And then sun lovers will take full on, like from morning till evening sun, it'll take that. So, but give them at least six hours, okay? This is um, St. John's wort. That's the name of this one specifically. F um, floral berry, St. John's wort or sangria. This comes in, you can see the flowers. It blooms like this and then it turns into this bright colored berried flower. Super drought hardy. Animals don't bother this. Takes full sun. And just a super unusual plant that you don't see at garden centers typically, except in the summer. So this would be one that you want to add to that. Remember that percentages, this would be a summer and fall type of plant. And then it's perennial. It's going to die back to the ground, come back, hibernate underground, and then come back fresh for you next, next spring. So great plant. Comes in several colors. Did I bring them? Yeah, it comes in. You see, you can have fun with them. Does great in containers. Uh, right there by the patio where it's got some real hot sun that things seem to die. This would love that. And so it's a very, very drought hardy, very tough, robust plant. Very unusual. And then the most popular of all of them, it's not that it's new, it just, it just came off the truck. Probably number one seller, not of a ground cover, but just number one selling shrub, Potentia or Potentella. See how the double L's? Um, this one gets up about knee high, perfectly ball shaped. Blooms from April till probably Halloween, and then it's deciduous, it'll, it'll lose its foliage, but this takes bright, hot, just hot sun, um, and then animals don't bother it. That's the big one. Out in the forest where you got some bright spots, we'll put these in because the deer are gonna leave it alone. Havilena, don't eat it. Um, so potentia is a great choice for here. Comes in a couple different colors, white, kind of an apple blossom, an orangey kind of color to it. This is the most popular, and I think it's the hardiest of all of them. It blooms the longest of all of them, so Potentia. With that, I'm done with my class. I, I guess I could touch on grasses. Okay, yeah. I brought this just because we're into the grass season, and people don't think of these as ground covers, but I think your short grasses can be used that way quite effectively. And they're so robust here. This is where grass, the prairies, we have prairies here. Grasses just grow wild. So this one just grows wild. You just see it out there. You're seeing it. It's knee high by the side of the road. That's this grass. And so you can grow this. This is uh, dwarf maiden grass. So maiden grass typically gets this, this. This one only gets this high. And it just has these blooms. It goes and grows. This one I used to line my pond with. I wanted a blue color. This is blue lime grass, um, has a plume on it right now. It stands about this tall and it's fully mature. It's been in for 10 years. And I just line my, I've got a lower retention pond where I grow strawberries, where overflow of water. So today it's gonna get some water as we're raining. And then, uh, so, it, so all my rain comes off the roofs. It goes into my pond. From there, it overflows, goes into a lower pond because I'm trying to control the water before it goes down the neighborhood into my neighbor's yard. She's got some flooding issues. I'm trying to help her out, trying to be a good neighbor. So we try to capture that. And so I used this, wanted it to look more garden -esque, not just like this big hole where I'm gathering water. So I put blue lime grass around it with strawberries in the middle of it. And it's beautiful. And it's just a pretty one. This one I will, uh, grass is another secret too. The reason I brought this, from pampas grass, the big boy, to the really short ones, bunny grasses, your fescues, the real short ones, and everything in between. Um, cut them back in March, like to whack them right back to the ground. That's something a lot of folks don't do. They'll leave them and they get this brown, especially pampas grass. It'll cut you up if you start touching it too much. It's got real sharp blades. Uh, so you gotta be a little careful or you hire someone to do that for you. Uh, but you cut them back down to where the curly cues are, down to about this high, kind of kind of 18 inches from the ground. If you don't do that, it will turn brown in the winter and then new green growth will grow through it. So you get this brown, green kind of mixed color to it. It looks not as, it, sh it should look better than that. If you cut it back and fertilize it, it's brand new color, brand new green growth comes back. So all your grasses would be that way. 
except bear grass and yuccas and agaves. <coughs> Those things. So bear grass, that's that green grass out in the out in Prescott Valley, Chino Valley, Paulden. There's a grass out in the out in the fields. Gets about this tall. It's got a white plume on it right now. That's an evergreen grass. It's really not, I don't even know if it's a grass. I think it's more like a yucca kind of thing, but it's keep the foliage on that up because if you let your landscapers whack it back to the ground, it'll take years for it to recover. That's a mistake I find that the rookie landscapers, maintenance guys do. The other one is, is uh, your yuccas. They'll treat them like grass. You know, the big red one that's blooming right now, they'll whack them right back to the ground and it'll take years for them to recover. It just, I'm, I'm embarrassed every time I see it. Um, for you in the neighborhood, just kind of, uh, it shouldn't be pruned. That's a, that's a novice or, or amateur move. So just make sure they kind of guide them going, hey, cut all my grasses back. But just tell them, but not this one and this one because maintenance folks are not the sharpest. I'm in the industry. I've had maintenance companies. Sometimes they have to be told what to do. And your grasses, they do really well. Okay, I will hang out, answer whatever questions you need, come take a look at the plants as much as you want, and then uh, next week's class, what was next week's class on? I forget, I think it's privacy screens? I think it's privacy. So anyway, it's online, watersgardencenter.com. There's a big class button, just take a look. Oh, easy grow, these, these kind of the bulletproof plants. Probably a variation of, of uh, native, so before you go, I'll let you clap. Yeah, thank you all. Appreciate you all tuning in online. Thanks so much. Again, I'll hang out for you as long as you want. Thank you. You bet. Mm -hmm.